our first night, we enjoy a great meal and a spectacular show at the Moulin Rouge. The next morning, after a cappuccino in front of our hotel on the Champs-Élysées, we walk to the Louvre. Along our way, we pass the Concorde and the gardens of the former Tuileries Palace. The Concorde was the center of the revolution, and here stood the guillotine that executed Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, Robespierre, and more than a thousand others between 1793 and 1795. The Garden of the Tuileries separates the Concorde from the Louvre. There she is. Wait, I was going to hold up the latest scam. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, you'll never find it in there. This Arc du Carousel was commissioned by Napoleon to commemorate his Austrian victories. Built between 1806 and 1808, it was based on the Arch of Constantine in Rome. Originally, the top of the Arc held the four famous bronze gilded horses of the Cathedral of San Marco in Venice. They were returned after World War II. The Louvre, with IMP's glass pyramid entrance is the world's greatest art museum. Despite her missing parts, leaning forward, her spray-sodden drapery clinging to her body, this Nike seems to be braving the full force of a tempest. The winged victory of Samothrace dates to 190 BC. The Mona Lisa is truly magnificent. The museum is four times larger than the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and you can easily walk your socks off. This Etruscan sarcophagus of a married couple dates to the late 6th century BC. The presence of the woman with her husband shows that in Etruria, unlike Greece, women and men were equals. A beautiful metope from the Parthenon that would probably look better on the Acropolis. Aphrodite, also known as the Venus de Milo, dates to 130 BC. She is one of the jewels of the Louvre's collection. The Champs-Élysées is an impressive promenade from the Concorde to the Arc de Triomphe. It is used for all major celebrations in Paris. From the top of the Arc de Triomphe, we can look down the Triomphal Way, leading to a group of high-rise office buildings known as La Défense. At the end is the Arc de la Défense, which was built in the 20th century. Actually, it is more like a cube than an arch. The Arc de Triomphe was commissioned by Napoleon in 1806 to commemorate his victories. This view looks back down the Champs-Élysées towards the Louvre. The famous Lido nightclub was a short block from our hotel. Looking across the Seine at the left bank, we see the golden dome of the church where Napoleon is buried and the symbol of Paris, the Eiffel Tower. The city of lights and my light. Barbara is looking at the tomb of the unknown soldier from World War I.
This relief is from a battle in 1792. Across the Champs-Élysées is the Grand Palace with its enormous glass roof. In front of the Grand Palace, along the Champs-Élysées, is a statue of Charles de Gaulle representing his march down the Champs-Élysées in 1944 in celebration of the end of World War II. The entire area is richly decorated. Across from the Grand Palace is the Petit Palace. Both were built for the World's Fair in 1900. The Petit Palace is in the Beaux-Arts style. Architecturally, it combines Greek and Roman forms with plenty of ornamentation. Rather eclectic. The Grand Palace has a classicist stone facade, Art Nouveau ironwork, and lots of glass. It is the largest existing ironwork and glass structure in the world. Built for the World's Fair, its statuary is intricately designed. It also has beautifully colored mosaics and intricately carved friezes. The Tsar Alexander Bridge was also built for the World's Fair and is lavishly decorated with gilded statues on granite pillars. Winston Churchill is just down the block from Charles de Gaulle. This beautifully crafted clock is of bronze and porcelain with an orchestra and singers. It was made for Madame Pompadour, courtesan and mistress to Louis XV. Parking is not really an issue if you have a smart car. On the banks of the Seine, opposite the Tuileries Garden, the D'Orsay Museum was installed in a former railroad station. The D'Orsay is a national museum and takes over where the Louvre leaves off. It displays collections of art from 1848 to 1914. It probably contains the richest collection of Impressionist work in the world. It has one of the most famous American works, Whistler's Mother. Adjacent to the Sarbonne is the Pantheon. Designed in the shape of a Greek cross, the dome is 279 feet high. The Pantheon was originally designed as a church for Louis XV, but was not completed until 1791 in the midst of the Revolution. The low relief on the pediment by David Angers is an allegory to the glory of great men. Some civil personages can be recognized on the left and military figures on the right. 
Following the revolution, it was transformed into a temple to accommodate the remains of the great men of France. Thus, a pantheon. Under the dome is Foucault's pendulum, demonstrating the rotation of the earth and first installed in the monument in 1851. A large number of paintings adorn the walls, including this one dedicated to the history of Joan of Arc. The National Convention by Sicard shows Mary Ann surrounded by members of Parliament and soldiers. In the vault of the apse is a mosaic depicting Christ showing the angel of France the destiny of her people. In the crypt, a statue of Voltaire marks his tomb. This vault contains the tombs of illustrious writers, Dumas, Victor Hugo, and Zola. Near the Pantheon, along this street, is the shopping center for the Latin Quarter. Locals enjoying a little refreshment. A local cheese shop. You mean there are more than three kinds? Barbara is checking out the main courses. And I'll check out the wine. No meal is complete without French bread. And no French meal is complete without a scrumptious dessert. It is hard to believe that a church this size needed flying buttresses. We visited the Rodin Museum because of the pre-modern sculptors. None was more sensational than Auguste Rodin. Barbara looks like she's on the phone with Balzac. The young woman in a floral hat was an early piece. He did many of these to earn a living. Rodin's finest work, which is monumental, dramatic, puzzling, for no one, not even he, knew what some of the scenes depicted, and forever mysterious is his Gates of Hell. The subjects are loosely taken from Dante's The Inferno. Beyond the Rodin Sculpture Gardens, is the Hotel des Invalides. It was founded by Louis XIV in 1671 to provide accommodations for the disabled and impoverished war veterans. A short time later, a church was added on with this 107 meter high gold-plated dome. In 1840, the repatriated remains of Napoleon were interred here. The altar area is modeled after St. Peter's in Rome. This was actually the first Jesuit church in France. Today, however, it is secular.
The tomb sits below the dome on the lower level. The large outer casket is made of red porphyry from Russia. Inside this tomb, the statue of Napoleon is portrayed as a Roman Caesar. Time for shopping in Printemps Hausmann, one of Paris's famous and fanciful department stores. I only wish I could be here to see him get out. The Paris Opera House, designed and constructed by Charles Garnier, is a grand landmark. Building of the Opera House began in 1863, but was not completed until 1875 because an underground lake was discovered during construction. The lake still exists and was the hiding place of the Phantom of the Opera in Paul Leroux's famous play. The style is monumental, classical based and opulently expressed with multicolored marbles and lavish statuary. The ambiance of the Parisian restaurants like this one at the Blue Train Station was only surpassed by the great food. We begin another day at the Louvre. The French sculpture garden was spectacular. This horse being restrained by a groom is a colossal work. Sculpted from a monolithic block of marble, it contains many details, such as a bridle and a tousled mane. The famous statue of Milo of Crotona was very powerful. Perseus releasing Andromeda, who had been chained to a rock. Very little is known about this phenomenal statue called the Tomb of Philippe Poe. The sculpture is so dynamic, it almost invites the viewer to join with the masked men in their procession. Napoleon III's apartments are an exceptional record of Second Empire decorative arts. The large drawing room typifies the taste for opulent interiors. The ceiling depicts Napoleon's vision of reuniting the Louvre and the Tuileries. The stucco decorations are elaborate. The state dining room features an imposing table. The 
This bed is in the chamber of Madame Recamier. This was her crystal makeup table. This 12th century eagle is made of silver gilt and porphyry, a special type of purple marble found in Egypt. These treasures are of the order of Saint Esprit in the 16th and 17th centuries. We have a leisurely lunch on one of the terraces with people from many different countries including these newlyweds. The Louvre has dominated central Paris since the 12th century. The glass pyramid built by I.M. Pei was inaugurated in 1989. He was also the architect of the new wing of the National Gallery in Washington. High above the city in Montmartre is the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. Designed in the Roman Byzantine style, it stands in stark contrast to the Romanesque style of other contemporary buildings. Montmartre, or the Hill of Martyrs, is a revered scene where the first martyrs of Paris met their death. Among them was Joan of Arc, Saint Denis, patron saint of France, and Saints Ignatius Loyola and Francis Xavier founders of the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church. On a clear day, you can see 30 kilometers. The basilica has maintained its beaming white color because during rains, the stones secrete calcite, which acts like a bleach. Owing to its many cabarets and decadent lifestyle, Montmartre became a gathering place for artists and performers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It is difficult to imagine such great artists as Salvador Dali, Monet, Picasso, Van Gogh, Lautrec, Modigliani, and Matisse working here. Just down the hill from the artist's square is the famous Café Les Consolats, where many artists spent their leisure time. That evening, France beat the favored New Zealand All Blacks in a semifinal of the Rugby World Cup. A cause for celebration. The Museum of National Monuments in the Trocadero has full-scale casts from the most beautiful French buildings. Because these casts were made before acid rain devoured the surfaces of France's prime architectural elements, the workmanship on this portal is more vivid 
than on the real cathedral. The Pompidou Museum is devoted to modern and contemporary art. Some refer to the building as inside out, as the functional elements such as escalators, water pipes, air conditioning ducts, etc. were color coded and installed on the outside of the building. The artworks, however, are first rate. Matisse's Le Lux the First. A portrait of Odette Hayden, done in 1918 by Modigliani. Picasso in his Surrealist period. In this room, the curators combined five large paintings by the Spanish surrealist Jean Moreau with several wire figures and a mobile by American Alexander Calder. The effect is a balance that is mesmerizing. We have a great view of the city from the top of the escalator in the Pompidou. Sacred Heart is on the hill. We metroed over to the Saint Germain area of the left bank. During the 20s, this area was a meeting place for artists and writers. After World War II, it became a haunt for jazz musicians and intellectuals. Today, it is a very expensive place to live. We stop at Le Du Magot for coffee and a pastry. At one time, Hemingway, John Paul Sartre, and Camus would have done the same. The Brasserie Lip is a preserve of the Belle Epoque world of 1900 and best known as a literary salon frequented by Ernest Hemingway, among others. Saint Germain's Romanesque Belfry is the oldest in France. A jazz resurgence. Saint Germain was first built in 542 and rebuilt several times. The philosopher and mathematician René Descartes is buried here. This is not him. The building housing the Cluny Museum and its medieval artifacts is one of the few real remnants of the Middle Ages left in Paris. The must-see of this museum are the six Lady with the Unicorn tapestries, some of the most fabulous late medieval tapestries surviving, which were made around the mid-15th century. The French inscription woven into the tapestries says, To my sole desire. This shining silvery white unicorn, it is said, could only be subdued by a true virgin. They depict one of the most beautiful women who ever lived in the guise of the five senses. It is hard to believe that these elegant tapestries 
were woven in the Dark Ages. From the Cluny, it is a short walk to cross the Seine. Sightseers on the Seine. Notre Dame is one of the earliest and greatest Gothic cathedrals. And this rose window is considered one of the finest. Built in an age of illiteracy, the cathedral retells the stories of the Bible and the history of the Catholic Church inside and out. Our return to the Louvre begins with the majestic wing victory of Samothrace. In the 7th century BC, the Assyrian Khorsabad court of Sargon II was protected by these genies at the entrances. Carved from a single block, they had a man's head and the ears of a bull. This so-called hero statue holds a lion in his arm as if it were a kitten. The colors are unparalleled. This is one of five carved slabs depicting the transportation of timber. This frieze is a famous work from King Sargon II. The colors in this mural are so vivid. This is a victory steel dating to 2300 BC during the Akkadian dynasty. This statue of Gudea, a prince of Mesopotamia, dates to the late 3rd millennium. The Law Code of Hammurabi is the emblem of Mesopotamian civilization. This steel, erected in the 18th century BC, is the most complete legal compendium of antiquity. This human form, dating to the 7th millennium, was found in Jordan. This colossal capital was one of 36 columns supporting the roof of the audience hall for King Darius I. It is typical of Persian design and dates to the 6th century BC. This decorative frieze is of polychrome glazed brick, circa 510 BC. Barbara stands next to the goddess Sekhmet, the powerful. A beautifully preserved sphinx. The ginormous Sphinx of Tanis dates to around 2600 BC. This area contains remnants of the moat and dungeon of the medieval Louvre, constructed under King Philip Augustus in the 13th century. The Orangery Museum building was part of the Tuileries Palace. The major exhibit is Claude Monet's 18-foot water lily paintings. The eight paintings are displayed in two oval rooms and they reflect the passing of the hours from morning till sunset. The obelisk of Luxor was installed in 1836. It is from the temple of Ramses II and is over 3,000 years old. Behind these beautifully ornate lampposts would have stood the Grand Tuileries Palace. Built in the early 16th century, the palace was raised in 1871 to open the view from the Louvre to the Arc de Triomphe. The fountains were added to the Concorde in the early 19th century.
Across the bridge is the Bourbon Palace, completed in 1728. But under Napoleon, the colonnaded front was added to mirror the Madeleine Temple across the Seine. Today, it is home to the French Parliament's lower house. We have had a great week. I will really miss the French restaurants. I think we'll be back. This trailer was added to remind me again of a few of the other great works of art that make up Paris's unparalleled collection. Cimabue's Virgin and Angels is of the 13th century. He is the first to get away from the stiff style into real humanity. Adding to the magnificent works of art, is the rich decoration of the palace interior. Of the dozen paintings attributed to da Vinci, five are in the Louvre, the magnificent Virgin of the Rocks. He painted her in 1490. Rubens' Medici cycle is 24 gigantic canvases created between 1622 and 1625 for Marie de' Medici. They display her life and times. She is seen here, a la Hollywood. Van Eck, dazzling Madonna with Chancellor Rollin, 1432. Elbrecht Durer's self-portrait is stunning. The Vermeers, like the lace maker, are still among my favorites. Van Dyck's Charles I at the Hunt, 1635. Rubens' Enchanting Wife. Franz Hall's The Roistering Bohemian Girl. Nicholas Poussin's famous Rape of the Sabine Women, taken from Plutarch's Life of Romulus. Autumn is one of Poussin's latest and greatest works, portraying the seasons in the form of landscapes and introducing biblical scenes is unique. Like winter here, the paintings have given rise to many interpretations. Georges de la Tour's The Card Sharps. De la Tour used the infinite mystery of sharp contrasts of light and dark. Genre painting or portraits of everyday life were Lenain's forte. This painting says so much. Watteau's profoundly moving clown, Gillies. Delatour's light and dark contrasts are most evident in Magdalene and the Nightlight. This painting portrays an 18th century Louvre. Ingress's The Bather is a masterpiece of harmonious lines and delicate light. Ingress obviously liked it as he returned to it in the Turkish bath. Chardin's The Skate, it marks the beginning of the artist's professional career. The realism of the different elements of this false still life has forever served as a model to artists. 
The crowning of Josephine by Napoleon at Notre Dame Cathedral was hugely captured by David. One of David's more famous paintings was never finished. David's Oath of Harati shows the father giving his sons their weapons to go to battle while the women suffer in silence. David's intervention of the Sabine women may have represented an appeal for national reconciliation after the revolution. Ingress's famous harem woman and his Joan of Arc. Garakult's famous The Raft of the Medusa is a magnificent depiction of the agony of shipwreck survivors. Another of Delacroix's famous paintings is the death of Sardanapalus, a major manifesto of Romanticism. The painting depicts the tragedy of the Assyrian king who massacred his wives and family and burnt his treasures rather than abandon them to his enemies. The despot is shown about to die, meditating on his life's pleasures. Delacroix's dramatic Liberty Leading the People, Delacroix said, if I did not fight for my country, at least I will paint for it. The Louvre sculptures were equally impressive. A 15th century Roman gate of marble featuring reliefs of Hercules and Perseus. Michelangelo's Bound Slaves, done about 1513 in marble. Canova's exquisite and delicate depiction of Cupid falling in love with the beautiful Psyche, done in the late 18th century. This warrior statue dates to 100 BC. It is signed by Agassius of Ephesus. Everything in the Louvre is exquisite and so beautifully exhibited. Gujan portrays the goddess Diana with her attributes. As the huntress, she is portrayed as tall and slim, carrying a bow and accompanied by a stag. Jean Goujon sculpted these bas reliefs of six nymphs to decorate the public Fountain of the Innocents in the 16th century. According to many, the ancient Greeks produced nothing finer. These 14th century life-size statues of Charles V and Jean de Bourbon are very imposing. These slender 13th century door sculptures of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba our splendid Gothic fantasy. Barbara is taking a much needed break. The Marley Court was loaded with powerful sculptures. Roman Emperor Claudius condemned Senator Paetus to death. To give him courage, his wife Aria stabs herself first and passes him the knife, saying, it does not hurt. This was considered heroic. Amphrotite, the wife of Poseidon, 
was sculpted for Louis XIV in 1705. Another of the great Marley horses. This one of marble has fame riding Pegasus. This relief by Puget portrays the Greek cynic and philosopher Diogenes telling Alexander the Great to move as he is blocking the light from the sun. This after Alexander had promised him any favor. The detail is phenomenal. Ronin's Eve is considered a bronze of extraordinary aspect, ashamed of her fault and shrinking in fear. The Walking Man reveals a contrast in styles. The Martyr, 1885. The Hand of God. These hands are just so delicate. The Spirit of War. One of his greatest achievements is the kiss, with its soft and silky appearance. Another early piece was a naked man called the Age of Bronze. The Monument to Victor Hugo. The Apotheosis of Victor Hugo. simply titled, The Three Men. This great sculpture is The Age of Maturity by Camille Claudel. Camille was Rodin's inspiration, model, and also lover. The statue of St. John the Baptist was influenced by the great bronze sculptors of the Renaissance. He had a great talent for creating an illusion of life through supple modeling. Even though bronze was best suited to Rodin's sculptural style, he recognized the superiority of white marble. Rodin claimed that there was a statue in each block of marble. It was just a question of divining it and bringing it out. Rodin's famous The Gates of Hell is a monumental door decorated in low reliefs inspired by Dante's The Divine Comedy. It was never finished, however, and never formally displayed. The Orangery Museum had a collection of some great paintings, including these by Modigliani. A cheerful Picasso done during his rose period while living in Paris. Utrillo was another of the great painters in Montmartre. One critic said only Joseph buys would have thought of a felt-covered piano decorated with a red cross. Maybe that's a good thing. 